I have been looking forward to this morning for a very long time and, and for our presenter this morning to be able to share with us the life and legacy of Coach Don Meyer. Uh, just to kind of give you an indication how I met our presenter, it was uh, this July, as you all know, that I started my position here as chaplain for athletics. And within like the first week or two, there's like a billion kids <laughs> of, of middle school age running around campus. And I said, what the, what's going on? And so I followed this trail of kids to the source. And in the gym, there's a giant uh, team camp going on. And so I'm walking around, I'm watching, uh, I'm watching the different uh, teams playing and whatnot. I ran into a, a few uh, Glen Ola Knights, uh, fellow Glen Ola Knights, one I was even cousins with and related to. Come on in, fellas. And um, as I'm watching and kind of imbibing and walking around, I noticed that one of the teams uh, on the front of their jerseys is their team name, and it's Erite. And I said, Erite. I know what that is. Erite is Greek for virtue. And so I, I'm like walking around the rest of the day, and I'm walking down the stairs, and, and behind me, uh, is a, a young lady from the team and, and what appeared to be her mom. And I turn around like, actually, what I actually said, I said, Arete, that's quite a name. And she looked at me and she said, actually, it's Arete. And I said, you're right. <laughs> you know what you're talking about. And then I said, well, tell me about the name. How'd you guys get this name? Well, and she said, you should talk to my, my husband. He's right over there. His name's Jared. And I said, that's a great name. I am going to go talk to this man. And so uh, I, I talked to Mr. Obering uh, a bit about where it came from, and he quickly shared that he had played for Coach Don Meyer. Uh, Don Meyer, if you have been around in the region, it should ring, uh, that name should ring in your ears a little bit. Uh, Don Meyer was uh, one of the most successful, or is one of the most successful collegiate basketball coaches in the history of the world. <laughs> Before Coach Shusevsky uh, from Duke uh, took over the NCAA uh, wins uh, leaderboard, uh, that leaderboard was uh, uh, on top of that leaderboard was Coach Don Meyer. He coached in uh, Tennessee for a number of years before coaching in Northern State in Aberdeen. Um, the team and the school that he beat in order to take, to, uh, to take that title and sit on top of the leaderboard was the University of Mary, <laughs> and so we share, we share that uh, top of the leaderboard distinction with him. Um, uh, Mr. Obering had uh, shared with me that, um, you know, the that Don Meyer had on his desk a plaque that said a plaque that said, "Erite," which means excellence or virtue. And I, uh, you know, shared with him what we we're doing here with greatness through virtue, and uh, kind of quickly resolved to have him come to campus at the first chance I got. Last thing I'm just going to say, because I know we have a lot of athletes here in addition to others, and I just want to say that the spirit with which you do something matters. The spirit with which you do something really does matter. Some of you have heard me tell this story before, but I'll tell you again, there's a kind of parable told about these cathedral builders, right? Uh, so you can imagine 500 years ago, 600 years ago, 700 years ago, what it took to build the kind of great medieval uh, cathedrals and all the stone and if you ever go to these, these cathedrals or these churches and you look around, you realize there's not really any stone around here, <laughs> you know? They had to drag that stuff over there. And there's a story told about this group of peasant workers dragging uh, stones up to the hill where they're going to build their cathedral. And uh, uh, someone comes along and observes and asks, uh, these people are, you know, struggling to pull the stone through the dirt and muck and the sloughs. And they ask, what are you doing? And one group says, oh, we're trying to get these stones through the muck and mud and the sloughs. Uh, and there's a guy who goes, okay. And then he goes to another group and asks, what are you doing? And they looked at him dead in the eyes and said, we're building a cathedral. The spirit with which you do something matters. And the spirit with which we're trying to achieve athletic excellence is a spirit that has a deeper purpose to it. And that's excellence in life, excellence in character. That's virtue. Uh, the speaker this morning uh, played for Coach uh, Don Meyer for four years, five years, mm -hmm. scored more than a thousand points uh, in his career at Northern State. He's now a husband and a father of three kids, two daughters and, and a son. And he, uh, in addition to his work, uh, you work at the school in Washburn, 
I'm the librarian. Guy. He's a librarian, the librarian, believe it or not. That's great. <laughs> uh, in addition to that, he uh, coaches youth uh, basketball and passes on uh, the knowledge he imbibed from Coach Meyer. So without further ado, put it together for Mr. Coach Jared Obering. Thanks, guys. Just so you know, the only people who call me Jared are my mom or telemarketers. So everybody else can call me Obi. All right, from that standpoint. But I'm honored to share some time with you guys today, and I thank Father Wolf for letting me come. I think if you ever want to, the greatest compliment you can give someone is to ask them to share their story with you, uh, meaning it's worthwhile. And um, I get to share Coach Meyer's story today with you and how he, sh he created a big part of mine. Um, so I played four years for Coach. Uh, he didn't want me initially, and which is probably hard to imagine looking at me. I mean, as a college athlete, five foot nothing, a hundred and nothing. Uh, and I asked a lot of questions. So I was probably super annoying to him. Uh, the turning point for him was during the, the state tournament, he was recruiting me and he counted 122 butt slaps by halftime before they stopped counting. Um, so that's pretty much the only way I got in. Uh, once I got there, even our security, our hallway security for our uh, locker room, very first game as a freshman, I walk up. And I'm walking in, he goes, what are you doing? Hey, what are you? What, you can't go back here. It's the players only. I'm a player. You didn't know me. No, he would not let me in. Jake the Snake, he wouldn't let me in. I didn't get Coach Sather to allow him to let me into the locker room because even he knew that I didn't look like a Division II athlete. Um, so anyway, you guys run a heroes theme, if I understand right. And I'm a history major, okay? Uh, I understand there's kind of a phrase that says, uh, keep your heroes at a distance. Right? If you look at people who have made major contributions to society and things of that sort, once you really get to know who they were personally, a lot of times you realize maybe you didn't know them as much. Uh, you can sometimes be disappointed. With Coach, the deeper we dig, the longer he's been gone, kind of the better he just keeps becoming. So um, how many of you have heard of Coach Meyer before? A few. Okay, great. That's not uncommon. Um, well, I could share with you a number of things. Uh, Father Wolf mentioned the all-time winningest coach of all time for a period. That's great. Um, he coached the two all-time leading scorers in college history. Okay, still holds the record. He has the all-time leading assist player in history, still holds that record. Um, you know, his friends, who he was, you ever heard of John Wooden before? Those two were two of the closest friends. Uh, Bill Self, Morgan Wooten, uh, Pat Summit, Bobby Knight. All those people. Maybe you're not into basketball. Maybe you're different sports. I'm sure you've heard of ESPN, right, and the ESPY Awards. Uh, in 2014, he was awarded with the, the Jimmy V Award, which was for perseverance. Uh, there's a YouTube video, actually, for about 15 minutes. It might be worth your time checking that out, telling you his, his whole story about that. Um, and maybe you're not into sports at all. Um, here's some stats to you, some info you won't find on Google. Uh, one, he coached for about 38 years. In those 38 years, there were only two players that didn't graduate through his program. Even if their eligibility was through, coach was well enough where he would pay for their final years of education, make sure they got their degree out of his own pocket. Um, another one you won't find, this is probably the most remarkable one, is that in those same 38 years of, of coaching, we can only find three guys that got a divorce. You know, and you think you compare that to what, you know, society's standards or ratios are for that. Um, this is a guy who could lead, who could influence and, and mold people. And what I'm, my plan is today is to kind of share with you how he did that um, in a way that maybe you wouldn't normally. Because um, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter who coach was or was. I could tell you all kinds of stuff. It doesn't matter what he did or didn't do. What really matters is, can he do something? Can he help you in some way? Okay. Um, so, um, Father Wolf gave you some handouts. Okay, Coach is a big handout guy. He had a big house uh, with a big basement, and a, he had a room in his basement that probably went from, I mean, it's probably almost twice the size of this space right here. He had file cabinets shelving high, as taller than I could see even, um, of just handouts. He believed in getting information to people. So, today, um, I'm going to ask you to take notes, and if you're not a paper and pen kind of person, that's okay. Um, Google Docs, if you've got a smartphone, I'm sure you do. Um, Google Docs saved my organizational life about 15 years ago. Uh, keeps it all, all in place for me. 
I may not write a book someday, but maybe my Google Drive will be worth something. Um, and here's the reason why. Coach had three, Coach ran basketball camps. He was one of the first mains. He ran 10,000 campers per summer through his summer camps. And he had three rules. I'm going to share with you the first one that made everything else in his program work. The first rule is everyone takes notes. Everyone takes notes. Now, you may not today. You may not feel like it, and that's okay. You can fake me out. You can be on social media, and I won't know, okay? That's between you and somebody else. But uh, the reason why is he said one is the most common trade among the 100 wealthiest people in our country is that they are great note takers. They gathered ideas. And the second thing is you got to know who you are a little bit. Our brains are not meant for storage, okay? We're meant for processing, okay? So the more we get out of our brain, the better we can process. The first phrase I'll have you write down is this, is we got to write, retrieve, to review. We got to write it down so we can someday retrieve it and review it when we need it. Write, retrieve, review. Because no matter how good of a job I do today or don't do today, um, 24 hours from now, you might remember two or three things from this. 72 hours from now, I'll be lucky if you get one. But if you write it down, you might get a dozen, right? What a better use of your time, return on your investment by doing it that way. And you may be wondering, well, why would I write this down? Who the heck is this guy thinking I got something worthy of you writing down? Um, one, you're probably right, okay? But this isn't my stuff. This is coach's stuff. Uh, two, you might not be going to education. You might not be into coaching. That's fine. You plan on being management someday, leadership of some sort. You plan on engaging with people in any sort of way. This stuff will apply. Um, because let's be real, you guys, we want things out of life, don't we, right? If you envision your life 10, 15 years from now, what are you doing with your time? What kind of a career do you have? What kind of a house are you living in? How successful of a career? What kind of vacations are you taking, okay? okay. We have once, that's normal. I'm going to tell you a little story about little Johnny. True story. Decades ago over in Great Britain. A kid named Johnny was in kindergarten. And as you can about imagine what most kindergarten teachers do at some point during the year. They put all their students in a circle around class and they ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, you have little kids. They say, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be the president. I'm going to be a professional, whatever, all these different things. And she got the student, little Johnny, and little Johnny replied, I want to be happy. And all the little kids in the class all kind of chuckle and giggle because that's not what she was looking for, right? But the teacher continued to press. She said, no, Johnny, you got to give us something, right? I just want to be happy. He was adamant about it. Well, little John, the teacher didn't know that little Johnny's mom had actually been very adamant with him. She wrote a note, handwritten note his mom still has today about how disruptive little Johnny was in class, basically scolding him. Well, little Johnny's mom told him the, the most important thing, Johnny, when you grow up is to be happy. You guys heard of the Beatles? Heard of John Lennon before? That's John Lennon, all right? So what's more important than being happy? Um, well, I don't want to disappoint you or not, but you're probably looking at one of the happiest people you will ever meet. Um, that might not be motivating, or maybe it is. I don't know. Uh, I consider it a self-proclaimed title. Uh, you may disagree with me, but I don't really care, because uh, that's how I feel. And you, hopefully I'm a motivation for you, because you don't have to be the sharpest or the smartest, right? Uh, my best friend, um, it works at Amazon now. He's an HR. He's in charge of about 32,000 people for Amazon. So he gets married in, in uh, Chicago, downtown Chicago. I'm, my wife and I fly in from Denver. And after the wedding, we're standing there waiting for our ride. And uh, this guy comes up to me. Now, I'm about five foot seven, right? The guy's about this tall. He comes up to me and he goes, yeah, yeah, give me dough, man. Give me dough. He's like hopping around a little bit. I just look at him. I go, I'm sorry. What did you say? He goes, give me toe. Give me toe, man. I go, I'm really sorry. Could you slow down just a little bit? Because I'm having a tough time understanding you. And then he literally like kind of throws his knee up in my face and he walks off. And while he was walking off, I didn't realize that I couldn't move my left arm. And the reason was that my wife had it so right into her side. She goes, what are you doing? I go, I don't know. She goes, that guy just tried mugging you. He said, give me your dough, man. I'm sitting there asking, I'm sorry, could you slow down and repeat that for me one more time? Okay. We don't have to be the quickest thinkers in the world, guys, to be happy. And the truth is, the older I get, the happier I become. 
and it's only because of coach. We all want stuff, right? What coach helped me with, with was wanting the right kind of things, the things that made meaning to us, okay? So we know money and jobs and houses don't make us happy. You've been told that before, right? We know that, okay? Does that mean you're not going to chase it just because we know it? Nah, I'm not the first person that's going to tell you this, but I will give you some things, some sound bites that coach talked about a lot. And the first one I would look at is money has yet to make a man rich. Okay, if you want to write that one down, you could. That'd be a good one. It's reminded me many a times. You've heard of the movie uh, It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey. Okay, Money has yet to make a man rich. It can make you wealthy, but it can't give you depth. Next one is money is the worst way to keep score. There's a lot of athletes in the room. We're competitive. Someday, well, we're, at this point, while we're athletes, we have a scoreboard that tells us, how are we doing? Are we winning or are we losing? Are we behind or are we ahead? When, you start, when your playing days are over, that scoreboard disappears. And we have to find something else to compare ourselves with to know whether we're at or not. And it's tough. So what do, we, what do most people do? What do most adults do? How do they compare success? How do they gauge it? How do they measure it? Money, prestige, right? Assets, things of that sort. We're going to be tempted. That's how it goes. I've been tempted. I know how it works too. Um, well, that being said, okay, don't run from money, okay? The last one I write down on money is money doesn't make you good or bad. It doesn't make you good or bad. It just makes you more of what you already are. If you're a greedy, selfish son of a gun and you win the lottery, your pride is going to be even more tight with things. You're going to be even more greedy. It's not going to change you. But if you're a giver and you're selfless and you come across money, how much good can you do, right? So... Knowledge itself is not going to prevent us from chasing those things. If you doubt me, um, ask an alcoholic if they think that alcohol is bad for them. Are they going to know? Yeah, they'll know. Yeah, this is, this is not good for me. I'm not going to stop them. You ask an addict if, uh, if they're killing themselves. Yeah, but I, most of them are aware it's not good for them, but it doesn't stop them. What I'm about to tell you is the same reason why most treatment rehab centers, their final step is to have one addict mentor another. Here's the phrase why. The reason why is we don't know it until we can coach it, guys. We don't know it until we can coach it to somebody else, to walk them through the same process. The way coach made us do this, he didn't just tell us these things I'm going to tell you here in a little bit. He made us practice them. We had summer camps. It gets muggy here, okay? But all of June and July for 17 straight days at Northern, Every summer, coach would bring all of his players in, and uh, he'd work us, our summer camps. He'd start early birds. We'd wake up between 5.30 and 6. We'd coach all day with campers. We'd eat three meals a day with them. We'd be done at 9, 9.30. We'd bring them back. Then we'd go back to the gym afterwards and work out. We'd lift. We'd come back and do player evals in Jerry Hall of Aberdeen, South Dakota, with no air conditioning for 17 straight days. And he paid us minimum wage. <laughs> yeah, it was awful. It was terrible. But it's also great memories. In those player evals, we're working with kids. We're, talk, we're telling kindergartners the same stuff we're telling you right now about money and about sports and about life. We were teaching it to somebody else. So, sound bites. Some of the things that coach made a difference for me is why do we want stuff? Why do we want to? I mean, we want careers, we want things. What are we really looking for with it? Even though we know it doesn't lead us to happiness, we still want it and desire it. It's because I think we're looking for peace of mind, ultimately. Isn't that why you want money? That's why you want security, right? You don't have to worry about those things. So here's his definition. Of, there's two ingredients to peace of mind. And the first one is personal relationships, okay? Personal relationships. Um, not just... Facebook friends or Twitter followers or things of that sort. It's how many people do you really know? How many people do you know their goals and they know your goals? Okay. That's how you measure this. There's two phrases here. Um, how do you know if you have a real friend? When you're with them, do you have to measure your thoughts or weigh your words when you're with them? Do you have to measure your thoughts? Do you have to be careful about how you say things? Or can you just be who you are? 
Can you say it the way it needs to be said? Can they trust your intentions and your, and your motives? Okay. Now, do we all want to be liked? Yeah, it's a human nature kind of thing. This helped me out a ton, this bottom one. People don't like you for what they see in you. How much time do we spend getting ourselves ready or trying to get the right kind of clothes or present ourselves the right way or posture ourselves the right way to be cool or look cool or act a certain way? People don't care. They care how you make them feel. That's a significant part of it. Um, next one. We've got uh, personal relationships. The next one's fulfillment of purpose. There's a reason why we call our, our summer program Arete. And as Father Wolf mentioned, it, it talks about virtue and those things. But also another meaning is, is it's fulfillment of purpose. The people we spend our time with, the relationships we have, and then also pursuing why we're here. So three things we had to do to figure out our purpose. One is we identify our gift. What makes you unique? What makes you different? Now, you guys are at a huge disadvantage. You're gen I'm going to say you. hope you don't mind that. Your generation. Um, we had phones when I was in high school and college, but we didn't have social media the way you do right now. So in order to identify your gift, a lot of times we got to take risks. we got to make mistakes. You know? And those are, four, those are things that you have to be so risk adverse anymore. Because when I screwed up, I'd be embarrassed for about a week, week and a half. And then somebody else would screw up just as bad as I did, and the, and the tension would be off on them now. It would go away. Does, do your mistakes go away? Nah, they stick around. They, they're, they're, they are there forever. After you identify your gift, you got to develop it. Number two, you got to work at it. We got to master our craft. That's where the work comes in. A lot of people have talent. There's nothing more common than the unsuccessful man with talent. And after we develop it, we got to give it away. This is the part that confused me in college for a long time. Because what are we trained to do, right? You have something that makes you unique, you're really good at something, that should be a sign you can make money with it someday, right? You can be successful, okay, and capitalize on it. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Until that becomes the focus instead of getting it out of you, okay? Um, hmm. So now we know it gives us peace of mind, right? Those are the two ingredients. The next thing then is, what gets rid of peace of mind? So, story for you. My freshman year, I got a lot for my freshman year. I don't know why. I'm sorry. I, first day of practice, we're coming on. I'm doing my stretches for, for our ball handling stuff and our shooting. And Coach Myers, about 6'2", 6'3". He's been coaching for 30 years by that point. He's got this gruff voice. He comes over to me and says, Obi, you better never start drinking. You're a people pleaser. You're a perfectionist. If you start, you'll never stop. And he walks away. And I'm sitting there thinking, what does he know? What is, what, what, what's going on, you know? It scared the daylights out of me. Well, I didn't know that his son, okay, Jerry Meyer, was uh, that guy I mentioned who was the all-time assist leader in college history. That, that happened to be his kid. And he had to kick his own son off of his own team his senior year, the best point guard in the country, because he found out his son was an alcoholic. He had to do what was best for him. He knew a thing or two. He's just looking out for me, right? Which is what Coach did. Now, that might be, so here's three things. Three things that we got to stay away from. Nothing good has ever come from drugs, pornography, or gambling. Real simple. Nothing good has ever come from them. Now, that might be really easy for some of us, okay? Great. We mentioned John Wooden earlier. Coach loved talking about John Wooden. When John Wooden graduated from high school, his dad gave him a little card, okay, with stuff on two sides of it. It was called a two sets of three. Okay, the first three things that were on there was don't lie, don't cheat, and don't steal. Which was somewhat biblical anyway, right? Those are really simple. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. I got a slide here for that. And if those are still too easy for us, okay, um, the next side, the second set of three was don't whine, don't complain, and don't make excuses. Now it sounds really easy, okay? Just because I know those things, does that mean that I don't whine or complain anymore these days? No, of course I do, right? I play video games with my son even though I don't want to because he likes doing it. So I play games and I'm trying to shoot him and he shoots me and I swear I shot him first. 
I swear the game is rigged and I'm, I'm almost yelling because I'm competitive and I hate losing, but I'm wanting, but it does help my rebound time. Okay, when I catch myself doing these things, ah, Obi, yeah, I know better. I know better. Yeah, that does help me out. Now, Coach loved this one too. It makes a painting or a life a masterpiece is what we leave out of it. These are the things, if we can leave them out of our life and how we live it, it's going to be a lot easier. I was going to say it's going to be a lot easier on you. Um, now, mistakes. So when we do screw up, okay, because we're going to, there's four things on mistakes that Coach talked about a lot. One is when we screw up, first we got to do is recognize it. Okay, there's something to fix. There's something to work on. After that, I got to admit it. I got to own it. And a lot of times, that's in the way of an apology if you do it to somebody else. Um, three is learn. We don't want to make the same mistake twice. You've heard that before. But here's another thought I want for you to think about, is that a smart man learns from his own mistakes, right? I screw up, I own it, I learn from it. But a wise man, he learns all from the mistakes of others. Why would I need to drive and get an accident without wearing my seatbelt to know that wearing my seatbelt is probably the right thing to do? And I pause if I say man in some of these things, okay? These are all old quotes, right? So I just, it comes off that way. Um, recognize, admit, learn. The last one, though, this is a tough one. And it's a tough one, especially for some of the gals in the room, is to forget. And I say that somewhat facetiously, okay? Yep, I, <laughs> thank you for understanding my intentions and motives with that. We are all homeo sapiens, but we are very different species in how our minds work. I mean, I've coached, I've coached guys, I've coached gals now. Um, I mean, here's a perfect example. It's a stereotypical, but I think you'll get the point. A guy who's middle-aged looks in the mirror, and he might be 30 pounds overweight. He might have a, a screwed-up hairdo, mismatchy beard, okay? And he's looking in the mirror, he's going to say, man, my shoulders look great today, you know? <laughs> he's going to see the thing that he likes in himself, which is how we're wired. A gal who could be a prima donna supermodel who spent hundreds and thousands on her hair, makeup, and all these different things, she'd look in the mirror and she'd say, gosh, when I smile, my left nostril doesn't quite match up with my right one when I do it this way. It's just how they're going to find the one thing they don't like about themselves, okay? But here's the thing about forget. we got to be able to move on when we screw up, okay? It is significant and important. Um, all right. Should we talk about the F word in college sports these days? The F word is a really common word that gets used. Coach was always opposed to it, so he created his own. Instead of using the F word, he used faith, family, friends, fitness, and finances in that order. It's a great way, just a real quick sound bite again for me to say, okay, what are my priorities? How am I spending my time? Where am I focusing at? Faith, family, friends, fitness, and finances. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, expectations and mentoring, um, I mean, can you imagine that guy yelling at you all the time? That guy, I think that was one of the reasons he recruited me because he knew he could yell at me, honestly. <laughs> Anything happened on the floor, the guy was, oh, me, dad, come get help side. Blah, blah. He'd yell all the things that everybody else needed to hear, but he'd yell at me all the time. And I think he got a personal enjoyment out of it. But he said at, every, at some point, all of us have to meet someone who sees greatness in us and then expects it out of you. You know, a lot of people, your parents maybe, or some will say your friends, oh, they see it in you, but are they going to expect it out of you? Um, accountability, that last one, we'll get whatever we inspect and accept. Um, and this goes for relationships too, guys. This goes for careers, you know, um, your spouse someday perhaps. If you are willing to, to put up with somebody who treats you terribly, who makes you feel insecure, there's a good chance you're going to get that. You'll settle for that because it's the path of least resistance. It's the easiest thing to go. But if you don't accept that, if you have higher standards for yourself, if you will only allow somebody to treat you well, and that's who you're going to share your time and your life with, that's what you're going to get. There's a book called The Compound Effect. Darren Hardy wrote Success Magazine. Great story. He, he was about 30-some years old. He wanted to find a spouse. So the goal-oriented, right? Write all your goals down. So he wrote down on, on five pages, front and back, what kind of a spouse he wanted. 
He wanted her to look, look like this, to be interested in these things, to have these kind of characteristics, this kind of personality. He wrote it real specific because you only get what you inspect, right? Well, then he looked at it and he figured he'd done it all wrong. He said, okay, this is what I want, but what kind of a person would this gal be interested in? That I can control. So he then took his focus off that. He wrote another four pages front and back about what kind of a person he needed to become that this gal would be attracted to, right? Focus on himself. Um, boy, marriage and relationships. Whew. Um, how did he do that? Three people, three guys. Um, phrase you can write down is no job too small, no sacrifice too big. No job too small, no sacrifice too big. I've built, I've built our house, I've flipped houses, I've built shops, I've done all kinds of things on farms. And a lot of times I would be, I'd come into the house after spending my, career, my, my day of my career, my day job, I'd be working outside all night, I'd come in and see that dishes are dirty, there's laundry to be done. I'm thinking, I ain't got time for this, right? I've been doing all this stuff for my family. I, now you want me to do this on top of it? No, that's a poor mentality. No job to Because on a good team, on a good team, one or two people will do the dirty work. But on a great team, Everyone does a dirty work, right? All right. Three things. Coach liked numbering things. I'm not sure why, but it's the way it all worked out. There's three things that we all got to figure out. Um, one is what do you want? Now, that can be a really deep question about life or, or whatever. It can also be as simple as what do you want to do next week? What kind of vacation do you want to take? What do you want out of your, out of your career at, at Mary? What kind of a degree do you want? Okay, it could be as simple as that. Identify what you want. And it sounds super simple, guys, but even as a 30-year, I was, I was selling for Butler Machinery. I created a, a territory out of scratch. I come to my boss. I have a customer who was upset about something or needing something or wanting something. And I'd tell my boss the entire story. I'd be in there for 10 minutes. He'd, say, he'd finally tell me, Obi, what do you want? What do you want from me? I couldn't hardly tell him. <laughs> You know, we got to figure, it's so simple to slip. What do you want? Second step is you gotta identify what's it going to cost? What's it going to take for me to get what I want? Now, sometimes that's hard. Sometimes there's no way for us to know. That itself would be the value of mentors. So we got to find somebody who's been there. And after you find out what it's going to cost, the third step is, you gotta ask yourself, am I willing to pay that price? Am I willing to do what it takes to get what I want? When I was in, uh, I moved to Denver for a while. I met a guy who uh, was making about a million eight a year. It's about $45,000 a week, okay? And he was making that whether he's gonna show up at an office and work or not. So me being 25, I said, if you want to teach me how to do this, I would love to learn. And he was willing to. So I was like, my plan, if I can make a half a million dollars a year by the time I was 30 in passive income, I would no longer have to worry about making decisions for my kids. I wouldn't have to worry about working or taking time or making it to their events, paying for their college. Life would be really simple. So I had a great mentor and I was working it. I was working 90 to 110 hours a week for about 18 straight months. And, uh, it was worth it to me. I knew it until I looked back and I said, okay, my daughter, Chevelle's our oldest. She'd been alive for 18 months at that point. I put her to bed six times in those 18 months. And when I realized that, I said, it wasn't. It was no longer, I was no longer willing to pay the price. So I had to get out. The price of things changes, okay, as time goes on. And sometimes the best decision we can make is to know how and when to quit, okay? Um, now, I mentioned here earlier that uh, Coach wasn't your typical hero, right, where there wasn't a dark side to him. But do you think that means he was perfect? Did he have flaws? Of course he did, right? But did that it stop him from influencing people or from leading people? No. Nah. Um, like I said, you probably never heard of Coach Meyer. A lot of you haven't, but... I want to ask you, what kind of a guy can have three funerals in two different states that fill venues with thousands of people in them, okay? Um, 
he was a remarkable, remarkable guy. And uh, how, do you, how was he able to do that? Another phrase you might want to consider is he owned his domain. Okay, now domain might be a fancy word, but domain just means the little chunk of the world that you can influence and control. Okay, um, and uh, here's what I'm going to pretty much end with today, guys. Is uh, one of his favorite books was by Fosty Westry. It was called "Make the Big Time Where You're At." Okay, and he taught me one of his greatest lessons. He taught me all these things, right? I mean, I, I took notes and did all this stuff. But he taught me finally how to use it at his funeral, okay? Um, when I found out Coach had died, you know, he, there's a whole story to this. It's unbelievable. But I'll let you find that on YouTube because you can find that on YouTube without me being here. Um, I, was, I was analyzing things. I was thinking, I was comparing myself and what I, would done, what I had done with my life at that point, and I wasn't measuring up, you know? Um, a phrase you can write down maybe is comparison is the greatest robber of happiness. Comparison is the greatest robber of happiness. I lived in a suburb once and you're always driving around your neighbor seeing, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's nice to have. That's a good, okay. Yeah. No. Nah. So three things happened. Um, I was feeling really insignificant. I go back to his funeral in Aberdeen, the Barnett Center. And before the wedding, before the wedding, before the funeral, <laughs> Coach always said, I won't make it to your wedding, but I'll be at your funeral if that ever happens. Before his funeral, a kid named Zach approached me. Um, I hadn't seen, Zach was a camper every year at summer. Um, he, was a, he was one of those kids where his ankles were about as big as his thighs all the way down, okay? Uh, he was a little heavier, thicker kid. He had the goggles, really thick glasses with the goggle straps that went all the way around, big bushy black hair. He's one of those kids we considered, we call, I mean, he was a motor moron. We call it, literally, he was mechanically, I mean, Motor skills, he just didn't have it, right? It was a complete descriptive. But he came every summer, and he loved camp. And Zach came up to me saying, hey, Obi, it's so good to see you, blah, blah, blah. I hadn't seen him since he was probably in sixth grade. And he said, uh, hey, before you go, I got to let you know, um, I want to thank you for what you did at, at summer camps for me. He goes, I, uh, I got in some drugs. I had to go through therapy, treatment, and I'm still fighting it. But he said, I went through some dark stuff, Obi, and I couldn't have gotten through it if it hadn't been for what you taught me. I hadn't seen him for 14 years. I still don't know Zach's last name. After the funeral, a um, kid named Dixie comes up to me. And Dixie looks like a lot of you guys in the front row probably. Broad-shouldered dude, right? Um, he was our ball boy at Northern. And uh, Dixie came up to me. He goes, oh, it's so good to see you. You know, blah, blah, blah. Hey, I, I, you know, my dad died three years ago. And... Uh, and he almost lost. He goes, I just, I, it was one of the hardest things I've ever gone through. But, you know, I just kept thinking about what you and Sundance taught me and, and talked to me about and stuff. And uh, I want to thank you. Man, okay. I don't know Dixie's first or last name, you know. And I hadn't seen him since who knows when. And then after, um, after the funeral, we had a player's meal, okay, upstairs in the Hall of Fame room. And I, I'd had enough of the day. I was, I was ready to move on. So I was walking on the hallway out, and a kid named Craig Nelson ran me down, former players, two years younger than I was. And uh, Craig said, oh, be, before you go, he goes, I just want to thank you for teaching me how to be a college player. Um, see, when I graduated from Northern, I was number two all time in average minutes played per game. There's only one guy who played more minutes than I had in the game. When Craig graduated, I was number three. You know what I'm saying? Um, now, am I telling you this to impress you? No. You know how unimpressive I am already, right? I'm telling you this to impress upon you that what we do in our domain matters. I felt like I was supposed to do something big with my life. I felt like I was supposed to be a Jeff Bezos or a Mark Zuckerberg or some leader of some movement. I thought that was my way. I was going to do something big. And I realized what coach taught me was that doing something big is doing something for the people around you because you can control that. If we're meant to have a huge platform someday and be one of those people, great. It's going to happen. But if it's not, we are still significant. So what I want you to do, what I would encourage you to do is, is these notes I gave you today, okay, from coach. Um, 
I hope you do someday retrieve them and review them um, and use them. If it can help you be a little better version of, of yourself, okay, so that someday you can share them with a friend who needs to hear them, share them with a family member who needs to have a little different change of perspective, you can give it to them. And if you're lucky enough and blessed enough to have kids someday, you can have an idea of what you want to talk to them about how to guide them. Um, so, in the meantime, one of the coach's favorite marks was uh, a guy named Albert Schweitzer. He said, in the meantime, just let your life be your argument. And uh, I appreciate your time today. I'm not going to give you any of these slides, just so you know, because I believe that handout about learning, okay? Uh, you read more, you read, learn more by writing down this and that, so I'm going to make sure you write it down. But if I can do anything for you, if I can be able to help anyway, my information is up there, um, I'd be happy to do what I can. But thank you for your time today, okay? Okay. Thank you. Good, good, good to take some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you guys have it, I'd love that. I uh, still rookie. I totally intended uh, to let you know that you were going to have an opportunity to ask questions, and I blew it. Uh, but now you know. Uh, if there's an opportunity to ask some questions, if anything stuck out to you, or anything, uh, if the story of coach's life, if there's any gaps there, you can ask. I'm going to kick us off by asking one. You kind of alluded to it. I think it's worth the worth the mention. You might know a few details that you can't find on YouTube. Good. Tell us about the end of Coach's life and, and how he died. Yeah, you some bet. stuff there. So Coach didn't believe in caffeine, okay? And he was a, I mean, that gum. He would just go. We had a Hall of Fame room that had a couch in it. And we literally found this out when we found how infrequently he washed his own clothes and sometimes went home because he, he wore khakis and a polo shirt everywhere he went. So one day he had a pen, a blue pen, ink, and it burst right in his pocket. It was blue, like from here to here. And uh, okay, you'd think a normal person would go home and like change clothes. Well, it'd been two days and coach was still wearing the same pants. Because <laughs> he'd just sleep in the Hall of Fame room. He'd be scouting, he'd be recruiting, he'd be doing stuff. And he would just, he slept in them and he just wore them for two more days after the pen burst in his pants, you know. So he didn't believe in caffeine. He would go. And uh, we were driving, I say we, sorry. Uh, the first year we had a re retreat, uh, Coach would lead us out to this uh, Kessler's uh, cabin where there was really well-to-do family. They let us, our team use it for free. We did a team bonding thing. So it was about year five or six they'd been doing that. Coach was leading the way and uh, he got tired. His car swerved and lo and behold, uh, one of our best friends, grandpa, was driving a grain truck and collided head on, fully loaded. Um, so coach had a ruptured spleen. He had, I mean, his, he was all messed up. His leg was so mangled, they ended up having to amputate just below the knee. And while they were operating, trying to keep him alive, they found uh, pancreatic and intestinal cancer in him. So, um, you know. He had, I think he was in the hospital for, oh, is it like 90 some days? And uh, this, the YouTube story does a great job of explaining it. But when he finally comes to after his operation, he can't talk. He's got a tube down his throat and his daughter's sitting there with him. And they couldn't understand what he was trying to say. So they gave him a pen and a paper. And he wrote, how long until I can coach? You know, he just lived and breathed it. And he missed coaching like no other. So he, uh, the day after he got out of the hospital, they, they, they got him out early at like 4.30 in the morning or something because we had practice at 5 o'clock every morning before school. So he made it that the morning he got out of, out of the hospital, he made it to practice in a wheelchair, and he coached the rest of that season and one more uh, before he couldn't do it the way that he wanted to do it. So I think he lived another two years after that. Another thing that coach did was even when he was uh, – He'd, he'd fly around. He couldn't fly anymore. So his wife, Carmen, drove him everywhere. And uh, he would do speaking engagement. The guy was unbelievable with the crowd. I mean, un he was awful one-on-one. -on -one. I will tell you, awful. But he was phenomenal with the group of people. Um, but he died with a full schedule. He had a calendar. He was still taking – the week he died, he was still sk scheduling future talks. Because if he could do it, he was going to do it. And he was in pain. I mean, my buddy Steve – all oh, dang, he was up in Sheridan, Wyoming, and he drove all the way out there. And he goes, I, I, I kept waking up during the night 
And I kept hearing this, this pounding. Like coach was in so much pain, he was hitting himself against the wall because he, he just, it hurt so bad. It goes, I don't think he slept all night. But the next morning he got up and gave an incredible talk with a group of people and he got off and he was just wiped out. You gotta conserve to serve, one of his other phrases. You gotta conserve your energy to serve others. Yeah. Okay, questions wise, I probably used them all up. My first week of practice, coach, uh, my high school coach was really good too. He was uh, at one point a year and a half ago, he had the longest winning streak in high school basketball in the country. And uh, he's a big questions guy. And so my first week of practice, I'm just grilling coach all the time during practice. He finally says, Obi, you get three questions a week. That's it. <laughs> so I had to make good use of it. Any questions? She's twitching. This is my fault for not warning other big questions to, to ask. Makes it easier for me. It's okay. I did put uh, Coach Meyer's website on there. So it's coach coachmeyer.com. If you, ever, if you ever become a coach or you're interested in that kind of stuff, there's free handouts down there. Everybody's probably got 80 of them. And they're just quick one-liners of stuff that was in his basement. And the sound bites are what's important, guys. You can't remember a whole handout, right? But if you can remember those sound bites and those moments of life when you might need a little something, you're looking for some guidance, you're not sure what to do or how to do it, that's where those sound bites are important. We'll, be, we'll give it up for Obi one more time. I just want to include with uh, something that Obi began with that I, I really appreciate it. You don't know it until you can coach it, you know. Um, and those stats that you began with as well, uh, two, only two of his players didn't graduate over the course of 38 years. And, every, and everyone minus three went yeah. on to kind of happy, successful, long marriages. Yeah, go ahead. And he had some guys. I mean, he had some guys that played in the league. You know, he wasn't just – Right. He had some – and some guys he had to pay a lot of money for <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> you know, there's some fifth and sixth and sometimes seventh year guys that, yeah, to check book out for. What 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 stands out to me about that, everyone? You know, we're at, we're at a. Uh, I, I I forget the numbers, and ninety percent of stats are made up on the spot, as we know. You know, but like if if you like do surveys and you ask like, "Am I an above average person?" How many people say yes? A lot you know, or we'll say I'm a good person, you know, but if you take that kind of measuring rod, you don't know until you coach it, right? Like, hey, the measure of, of the kind of person I am, the kind of character I am can be measured by my influence on the people around me. Huh? And, I, and I think that's just another example of, of where uh, sports and excellence in sports uh, and excellence of character really do overlap because the measure we all know like the measure of our success on the court and on the field as well, isn't just about leading scores, right? Every losing team in America has a leading scorer on it. Every leading fo losing football team in America has a leading tackler and a touchdown leader, right? It's, it's not measured by uh, just my individual statistics. It's measured by the success of the team, you know? Well, that's, there's something true about life as well. That's something that I'm gonna take with me. Uh, and and measure myself by as well, not just what I know personally, but what I can coach and help others to achieve. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to draw to a close here.